Hi guys. So I had my bird with me this time because last time she was really noisy. So she likes being close to me. So now you have me and her to look at. Yay. <laughs> so today is chapter 23, the Yule Ball. Despite a very heavy load of homework that the fourth years have been given for the holidays, Harry was in no mood to work when the term ended and spent the week leading up to Christmas enjoying himself as fully as possible along with everybody else. Gryffindor Tower was hardly less crowded now than during term. It seemed to have shrunk slightly, too, as inhabitants were being so much rowdier than usual. Fred and George had had a great success to their canary creams, and for the first couple of days of the holidays, people kept bursting in feather all over the place. Before long, however, all the Gryffindors had learned to treat food Anybody offer, anybody else offered them with extreme caution in case it had been the canary cream concealed in the center. And George confided to Harry that he and Fred were now working on developing something else. Harry made a mental note never to accept so much as a crisp from Fred and George in the future. He still hadn't forgotten Dudley and the ton, ton, tongue toffee. Snow was falling thickly upon the castle and now, and its grounds now. The pale blue Boboton carriage looked like a large chili frosted pumpkin next to the ice gingerbread house that was Hagrid's cabin, while the drumstring ship's uh, portholes were glazing with ice and ringing white with frost. The house elves down in the kitchen were outdoing themselves with a series of rich warming stews and savory puddings, and only Fleur Delacour seemed to be able to find anything to complain about. It's too heavy, as says Hogwarts food, they heard her saying uh, grumpily as they left the great hall behind her one evening. Ron skulking behind Harry, keen not to be spotted by Fleur. I will not fit into my dress robes. <laughs> oh, there's a tragedy, <laughs> said Hermione snappily. As Fleur went to the entrance hall, she really thinks a lot of herself, that one, doesn't she? Hermione, who are you going to do you ball with, Ron asked. He kept springing the question on her, hoping to startle her into a response by asking when she least expected it. However, Hermione merely frowned and said, I'm not telling you. You'll just take the fun out of it for me. You're joking, Weasley, said Malfoy behind them. You're not telling me someone asked that to the you ball. Not that long mallard mudblood. Harry and Ron both ripped around, and Hermione said loudly, waving to someone over Malfoy's shoulder, Hello, Professor Moody! Malfoy went pale, jumped backwards, looking wildly around him for Moody. But he was still up to the staff table, finishing his stew. Twitchy little ferret, aren't you, Malfoy? said Hermione scathingly. She said, Harry and Ron went up to the marble staircase, laughed heartily. Hermione said Ron, looking sideways at her, suddenly frowning. Your teeth? What about them? She said. Well, they're different. I've just noticed. Of course they are. Did you expect me to keep those fangs Malfoy gave me? No, I mean, they're different to how they were before you put the hex on you. They're all straight and normal-sized. Hermione suddenly smiled very mischievously. And Harry noticed it, too. It was a very different smile than the one he remembered. Well, when I went to Madame Pomfrey to get them shrunk, she held up the mare and told me to stop her when they were right back where how they normally were, she said. And I just let her carry on a little bit. <laughs> she smiled even more wildly. Mom and Dad won't be too pleased. I've been trying to persuade them to let me shrink them for ages, but now they wanted me to carry on with my brace. You know, they're dentists. They just don't think teeth and magic should... Look! Pidgewinch's back! Ron's tiny owl was twitching madly on the top of the uh, icicle-laden banisters. A scroll of parchment tied to his leg, people passing him were pointing and laughing, 
And a group of third year girls paused and said, Oh, look, a wee owl. Isn't he cute? Stupid little feathery git, Ron hissed. Hurrying up the stairs and snatching Pigwidgeon up, you bring letters straight to the address, or address, you don't hang around showing off. Pidwidgeon hooted happily, then headed, protruding over Ron's fist. The third-year girl all looked very shocked. Clear off, Ron snapped at them, waving his fist, holding Pidwidgeon, who hooted more happily than ever as he soared through the air. Here, take it, Harry, Ron added in an undertone as a third-year girl scuttled away looking scandalized. He pulled Sirius's reply off of Pidwidgeon's leg. Harry pocketed it, then hurried back to the Gryffindor Tower to read it. Everyone in the common room was was much busy, much too busy letting off more holiday steam to observe what anyone else was up to. Harry, Ron, Hermione sat apart from everyone else by a dark window that was gradually filling up with snow, and Harry read out. Dear Harry, Congratulations on getting past the horntail. Whoever put your name in that goblet shouldn't be feeling too happy now. I was going to suggest a con conchivitis curse, as the dragon's eye was his weakest point. That's what Crumb did, Hermione said, whispered. By the w but your way was better. I'm impressed. Don't get complacent, though, Harry. You've only done one task. Whoever puts you in that tournament got plenty more opportunity if they're trying to hurt you. Keep your eyes open, particularly when the person we discussed is around. And concentrate on keeping yourself out of trouble. Keep in touch. I want to hear about anything unusual. Serious. He sounds exactly like Moody, said Ron, quietly tucking the letter away again inside his robes. Constant vigilance. You think I'd walk around with my eyes shut, banging on the walls, bang, or banging off walls. But he was right, Harry, said Hermione. You still have two more tasks to do. You really ought to have a look at that egg, you know, and start working it out, what it means. Hermione, we've got ages, snapped Ron. What a game of chess, Harry. Want a game of chess, Harry? Yeah, okay, said Harry. Then spotted the look on Hermione's face, he said, Come on, how am I supposed to concentrate with all this noise going on? I won't even be able to hear the egg over this lot. Oh, I suppose not, she sighed. And she sat down to watch their chess match, which uh, cul culminated in an exciting checkmate of Ron's involving a couple of recklessly brave pawns and a very violent bishop. Harry awoke very suddenly on Christmas Day, wondering what had curse caused his abrupt return to consciousness. He opened his eyes and saw something with very large, round, green eyes staring back at him in the darkness, so close they were almost nose to nose. <coughs> Dobby! Harry yelled, screaming uh, scrambling away from the elf so fast he almost fell out of his bed. Don't do that! Dobie is sorry, sir! Squeaky Dobie, an uh, squeaked Dobie anxiously, jumping backwards with his long fingers over his mouth. Dobie is wanting to wish Harry Potter Merry Christmas and bring him a present, sir. Harry Potter did say Dobie could come and see him sometime, sir. It's okay, said Harry, still breathing rather faster than usual. While his heart rate returned to normal, just, just prod me or something in the future, all right? Don't bend over me like that. Harry pulled back his hangings around his four-poster bed and took, off his, uh, took his glasses from his bedside table to put them on. His yell had awoken Ron, Seamus, Dean, and Neville. All of them were peering through the gapes of their own hangings, heavy eyes, and tossed hair. Someone attack you, Harry? Seamus asked she, uh, sleepily. No, it's just Dobie, Harry muttered. Go back to sleep. Nah, presents, <laughs> said Seamus, spotted a large pile at the foot of his bed. 
Ron, Dean, and Neville decided that now they were awake. They might as well get down to their uh, presence opening, too. Harry turned back to Dobby, who was now standing nervously next to Harry's bed, still looking worried as he had upset Harry. There's a Christmas uh, bauble tied to loop on the top of his tea cozy. Can Dobby give Harry Potter his present? He squeaked tentatively. Of course you can, said Harry. And I got something for you, too. I had to lie. He, had brought, he hadn't bought anything for Dobby at all, but he quickly opened his trunk and pulled out a particularly knobbly rolled-up pair of socks. They were his oldest and foulest, mustard-colored, and had once belonged to Uncle Vernon. The reason they were extra knobbly was that Harry had been using them to cushion his sneakoscope for over a year now. He pulled out his sneakoscope and handed the socks to Dobby, saying, Sorry, I forgot to wrap them. But Dobby was utterly delighted. Socks are Dobby's favorite, favorite clothes, sir, said, he said, ripping off his old ones and pulling on Vern, Uncle Vernon's. I have seven now, sir, but sir, he said, his eyes widening, having pulled both socks up to his highest extent so that they reached to the bottom of his shorts. They had just, they had made a mistake in the shop, Harry Potter. This is giving you two, two the same. Oh, no. How, how come they didn't spot that, said Ron, grinning over from his, uh, his own bed which was now strewn with wrapping paper. Tell you what, Doby, here you go. Take these two and you can mix them up properly. And here's your jumper. He threw Dobby a pair of violet socks. He had just unwrapped and the hand knitted sweater Mrs. Lee's, Mrs. Weasley had sent. Doby looked quite overwhelmed. Sir, very kind, he squeaked his eyes brimming with tears, bowing deeply to Ron. Dobie knew Sir must be a great wizard, for he is Harry Potter's greatest friend. But Dobie did not know that he was also a generous of spirit and noble and selfless. They're only socks, said Ron, who had gone slightly pink around the ears, though looking rather pleased all the same. Wow, Harry, he just opened up Harry's present from Chudley Cannon's hat. Cool, he jammed it on his head where he clashed horribly with his hair. <clears throat> Doby now handed Harry a small package which turned out to be socks. Doby is making them himself, sir, the elf said happily. He is buying the wool out of his wages, sir. The left sock was bright red and had a pattern of broomsticks upon it, and the right sock was green with a pattern of snitches. They're, they're really well, or they're, they're really, well, thanks, Dobby, said Harry as he pulled them on, causing Dobby's eyes to leak with happiness again. Dobby must go now, sir. We are already making Christmas dinner in the kitchens, said Dobby as he hurried out of the dormitory, waving goodbye to Ron and to the others as he passed. Harry? Harry's other presents were much more satisfactory than Dobby's old socks, with the obvious exception of the Dursleys, which considered, uh, consisted of a single tissue and all-time low. Harry supposed, too, were remembering the tongue, the ton tongue toffee, Harry had given Harry a book called Quidditch Teams of Britain and Ireland. Ron was bulging bag of dung bombs. Sirius, a handy uh, pen knife that, uh, with attachments to unlock any lock and undo any knot. And Hagrid, a vast box of sweets, including all of Harry's favorites. Bertie bots every flavor beans. Chocolate frogs and... Uh, Drubal's best blowing gum and Fizzy's Whizbees. Dottie, come on. Sorry, my dog is like wanting attention. There was also, of course, Mrs. Weasley's usual package, including a new jumper, green with a picture of a dragon on it. 
Harry supposed Charlie had told her all about the horn tail with a large quantity of homemade mince pies. Harry and Ron met with Hermione in the common room and they sat down to breakfast together. And they spent most of the morning in the Gryffindor Tower, where everyone was enjoying their presence, then returned to the Great Hall for a magnificent lunch, which included at least a hundred turkeys and Christmas puddings and large piles of cribbage, wizards, and crackers. The all they went out to the grounds in the afternoon, and the snow was untouched except for the deep channels which may made by the drumstring and Bobaton students on their way up to the castle. Hermione chose to watch Harry and Weasley's snowball fight rather than join in. And at five o'clock, said she was going back upstairs to get ready for the ball. What? You need three hours? Yes, Ron. Yes, we do. <laughs> you what? You need three hours, said Ron, looking at her incredulously and paying for a lapse in concentration when a large snowball thrown by George hit him hard on the side of the head. Who are you going with, he yelled after Hermione, but she just waved and disappeared up the stone steps into the castle. There was no Christmas tea today as the ball included a feast, so at seven o'clock, when it had become hard to aim properly, the others abandoned their snowball fight and trooped back into the common room. The fat lady was sitting in her frame with her friend Violet from downstairs, both of them extremely tipsy. Uh, empty boxes of chocolate liqueurs littering the bottom of her picture. Larry fights, that's the one! She giggled when she gave the password and she swung forward to let them inside. Harry, Ron, Samus, John, and Neville changed into the dress robes up in the dormitory all of them looking very self-conscious, but none as much as Ron. Poor Ron. Who surveyed himself in a long mirror in the corner with an appalled look on his face. There's just no getting around the fact that his robes looked more like a dress than anything else. In a desperate attempt to make them look more manly, he used a severing charm on the ruffs and Ruffs, rough and cuffs. It worked fairly well. At least he was now lace-free, although he hadn't done a very neat job, and the edges still looked depressively frayed as they set off downstairs. <clears throat> I still can't work out how you two get the best-looking girls in the year, muttered Dean. Animal magnetism, said Ron gloomily, pulling a stray, uh, pulling strays of threads off his cuffs. The common room looked strange, full of people wearing different colors instead of usual masks of black. Pavarti was waiting for Harry at the foot of the stairs. She looked very pretty indeed, in her robes of shocking pink with her long, dark plate braided with gold with her long hmm, dark plate braided with gold and gold bracelets glimmering on her wrists. Harry was relieved to see that she wasn't giggling. You are look nice, he said awkwardly. Thanks, said she said. Padma's going to meet you in the entrance hall, she added to Ron. Right, said Ron, looking around. Where's Hermione? Pravati, Pravati shrugged. Shall we go down then, Harry? Okay, said Harry, wishing he could just stay in the common room. Fred winked at Harry as he passed on his way out the portrait hole. The entrance hall was packed with students too, all milling around waiting for the eight o'clock when the doors of the great hall would be thrown open. <clears throat> Those people who were meeting partners from different houses were edging towards the crowd, trying to find each other. Parvati, Parvati found her sister Padma and led her over to Harry and Ron. Hi, Pat, said Padma, who was looking just as pretty as Parvati, in robes of bright turquoise. She didn't look too enthusiastic about having Ron as a partner, though her eyes dark eyes lingered on the frayed neck and sleeves of his dress robes 
as she looked him up and down. Hi, said Ron, not looking at her, but staring around at the crowd. Oh, no. He bent his knees slightly to hide behind Harry, because Fleur Delacour was passing, looking stunningly in robes of silver-gray satin, and accompanied by a Ravenclaw Quidditch captain, Roger, Roger Davies. When they had disappeared, Ron stood straight again and stared over uh, the heads of the crowd. Where is Hermione? <laughs> he said again. A group of Slytherins came up the steps from their dungeon, dungeon common rooms. Malfoy was in front. He was wearing dress robes of black velvet and a high collar, which in Harry's opinion made him look like a Vizar. Is there the scar? Hmm. Pansy Parkinson was clutching Malfoy's arm in a very in very frilly robes in pale pink. Crab and Goyle were both wearing green. They resembled moss-colored boulders, and, and neither of them, Harry was pleased to see, had managed to find a partner. The oak doors opened and everyone turned to look at the drum staring students enter with Professor Cockeroff. Crumb was at the front of the party, accompanied with, uh, accompanied by a girl, a uh, pretty girl in blue robes. Harry didn't know. Over their heads, he saw <clears throat> that an era area of lawn right in front of the castle had been transformed into a sort of grotto full of fairy lights, meaning hundreds of actual living fairies were sitting in the rose bushes and had been conjured there and fluttering over the statues of what seemed to be Father Christmas and his reindeer. Then Professor McGonagall's voice called, Champions, over here, please. Parvati uh, readjusted her bangles, beaming. She said, uh, she and Harry said, see you in a minute, to Ron and Padma and walked forward and chattering crowd pardoning to let them through professor mcgonagall who'd been wearing dress robes of red tartan ha and had arranged a rather ugly wreath of thistles around the brim of her hat told them to wait on one side of the doors while everyone else went inside they were to enter the great hall in procession when the rest of the students uh had sat down Lord Delacour and Rogers Davies stationed themselves nearest the doors. Davies looking so stunned by his good fortune to have ha in having Fleur as a partner that he could hardly take his eyes off of her. Cedric and Cho were close to Harry too. He looked away uh, from them so he wouldn't have to talk to them. His eyes instead fell upon the girl next to Crom. His jaw dropped. It was Hermione, but she didn't look like Hermione at all. She had done something with her hair, and it was no longer bushy, but sleek and shiny and twisted up in an elegant knot on the back of her head. It's a beautiful picture there. I'll make sure I post it for you guys. She was wearing robes that may, made of a floaty periwinkle blue material. And she was holding herself differently somehow. And maybe it was merely just the absence of the 20 or so books she usually had slung over her back. She was also smiling rather nervously. It was true, but the reduction in the size of her front teeth was more noticeable than ever. Harry couldn't understand how he hadn't spotted it before. Hi, Harry, she said. Hi, Pravardi. Pravardi was gazing at Hermione in... in unflattering disbelief she wasn't the only one either when the doors to the great hall opened crumbs fan club from the library stalked past throwing hermione looks of deepest loathing pansy parkinson gaped at her as she walked by with malfoy and even he didn't seem to be able to find an insult to throw at her ron however walked right past hermione without looking at her <clears throat> Once everyone else was settled in the hall, Professor McGonagall told the champions that their partners to get in line in pairs and, fo and follow her. 
They did so, and everyone in the Great Hall applauded as they entered and start, uh, started walking up towards the large round table at the top of the hall where the judges were sitting. The walls of the hall had been covered in a sparkling silver frost with hundreds of garlands of mistletoe and ivy crossing the starry black ceiling. The house tables had vanished. Instead, there were about a hundred smaller lantern-lit ones, each sitting about a dozen people. Harry concentrated on not tripping over his feet. Her body seemed to be enjoying herself. She had beaming around at everyone, staring. Harry so forcefully that he felt as though he was a show dog. She was putting on, uh, pitting through the paces. He caught sight of Ron and Padma as he neared the top table. Ron was watching Hermione pass with narrowed eyes. Padma was looking sulkily. Dumbledore smiled happily as the champions approached the top of the table, but Karkaroff wore an expression remarkably like Ron's as he watched Crumb and Hermione draw nearer. Ludo Bagman, tonight in robes of bright purple with large yellow stars, was clapping as enthusiastically as any of the students, and Madame Maxine, who had changed her usual uniform to black satin for a flow uh for a flowing gown of lavender silk, she applauded politely. But Mr. Crouch, Harry suddenly realized, was not there. Harry suddenly realized was not there. The fifth seat at the table was occupied by Percy Weasley. When the champions of their partners reached the table, Percy drew out an empty chair beside him, staring pointedly at Harry. Harry took the hint and sat down next to Percy, who was wearing brand new navy blue dress robes with an expression of great smugness. I've been promoted, <laughs> Percy said before Harry could even ask. But from his tone, he might as well have been announcing his election as supreme ruler of the universe. I am now Mr. Crouch's personal assistant, and I'm here representing him. Why didn't he come, Harry asked. He wasn't looking forward to being lectured on cauldron bottoms as uh, at all through dinner. I'm afraid to say Mr. Crouch isn't feeling well. Not well, all right. Hasn't been right since the World Cup. Hardly surprising, overworked. He's not as young as he was, though still quite brilliant, of course. My mind remains, uh, the mind remains as great as it ever was, but the World Cup was a fiasco for the whole ministry. And then Mr. Crouch suffered a huge personal loss, personal shock when his miss went with the misbehavior of that house elf of his Blinky or whatever she's called. Naturally, he dismissed her immediately afterwards. But, well, as I say, he's getting on. He needs looking after, and I think he's found a definite drop in his home comfort since he's left. And then we had a tournament to arrange in the after aftermath of the cup to deal with. That revolting Skeeter woman buzzing around. Poor, no, poor man. He's having... A well-earned, quiet Christmas. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, guys. My throat kind of hurts. I'm just glad he knew he had someone he could rely upon to take his place. Harry just wanted... Harry wanted very much to ask Mr. Cou Crouch. Uh, had stopped calling Piercy Weatherby. Yet, he resisted the temptation. There was no food as yet on the glittering golden plates, but small menus lying in front of them. Harry picked up his uncertainly and looked around. There was no waiters. Dumbledore, however, looked carefully down at his own menu and then said very clearly to his plate, Pork chops. <laughs> and pork chops appeared. <laughs> uh, getting the idea, the rest of the table placed their orders with their plates too. Harry glanced over Hermione to see she had felt about this new and more complicated method of dining. Surely it meant plenty of extra work for the house elves, but for once, Hermione didn't seem to be thinking of spew 
S P E W. <clears throat> she was deep in talk with Victor Crumb and hardly seemed to notice she was eating at all. It had now occurred to Harry that he had never actually heard Crumb speak before, but he was certainly talking now and very enthusiastically at that. Well, they have a castle also, not as big as this, nor as comfortable. I am thinking, he was telling Hermione, they have just four floors and fires are lit only for magical purposes. But they have grounds larger even than these, though in winter we have very little daylight, so we are not enjoying them. But in the summer we are flying everywhere, over the lakes and the mountains. Now, now, Victor, said Karkaroff, with a laugh he didn't reach his cold eyes. Don't go giving away anything else now. Uh, or your charming friend will know exactly where to find us. Dumbledore smiled, his eyes tinkling. Igor, all this secrecy. One would almost think you didn't want visitors. Well, Dumbledore, said Karkaroff, displaying his yellowish teeth to the fullest extent, we are all protective of our private domains, are we not? Do we not jealously guard our halls and learning halls of learning that we have been entrusted to us are we not right to be proud that we know we alone know our school secrets and the right to protect them oh i would never dream of assuming i know all of hogwarts secrets igor said dumbledore only this morning for instance i took a wrong i took a wrong turning on the way to the bathroom and found myself in a beautifully proportioned room I have never seen before, containing a really rather magnificent collection of chamber pots. When I went back to investigate more closely, I discovered that the room had vanished. <laughs> but I must keep an eye out for it, possibly if there's an excess, uh, if it's only accessible at 530 in the morning, or if it may appear at the quarter noon, uh, quarter moon. Oh, and the seeker has an exceptionally full bladder. <laughs> Harry snorted into his plate of goulash, uh, Percy frowning, but Harry could have sworn Dumbledore had given him a very small wink. Meanwhile, Fleur Delacour was criticizing the Hogwarts decorations to Roger Davies. This is nothing, she said dismissively, looking around the sparkling walls of the Great Hall. As the pal Palace of Bomaton weave ice sculptures all around the dining chamber at Christmas. They do not melt, of course. They are like huge statues of diamonds glittering in the place. And the food is simply, uh, yeah, simply superb. We have choir, uh, Choirs, wood nymphs, and oceranators as we eat. We have none of these ugly armor in the halls. And if Poltergeist ever entered, uh, in, ever entered into Bomaton, he would be expelled like that. She slapped her hand on the table impatiently. Rogers Davies was watching her talk with a very dazed look on his face and kept missing his mouth with his fork. <laughs> Harry had the impression that Davies was too busy staring at Fleur to take a word of what she was saying in. <clears throat> Absolutely right, he said quietly, slapping his own hand down on the table in imitation of Fleur. Like that, yes. Harry looked around the hall. Hagrid was sitting at one of his other staff tables. He was back in, in his horrible Harry Brown suit and gazing up at the table, top table. Harry saw him give a small wave and looked around, saw Madame Maxine return it, and opals glittering in the candlelight. Hermione was now teaching Crumb to say her name properly. He kept calling her Ermie. Hermione, Hermione, Hermione.
she said slowly and clearly. Hermione, close enough, <laughs> she said, catching Harry's eyes and grinning. When all the food had been consumed, Dumbledore stood up and asked the students to do the same. Then, at the wave of his wand, <clears throat> the table zoomed back down the uh, along the walls, leaving the floor clear, and then he conjured a raised platform into existence along with the right-hand wall. A set of drums, several guitars, a lute, and cello, and some bagpipes were set upon. <clears throat> The weird sisters were uh, the weird sisters now trooped up <coughs> onto the stage to wildly enthusiastic applause. They were all extremely hairy and dressed in black robes that had been artfully ripped and torn. They picked up their instruments and Harry, who had been interested in watching them as he had almost forgotten that they were coming, suddenly realized that the lanterns on all the other tables had gone out. And the other champions and their partners were standing up. Come on, Pavardi hissed. We're supposed to dance. Harry tripped over his dress robes as he stood up. The weird sisters struck up a low, mournful tune. Harry walked onto the brightly lit dance floor, carefully avoiding the uh, avoiding catching anyone's eyes. He could see Seamus and Dean waving at him and snickering. The next moment, Pavardi had seized his hands, placed one around her waist, and was holding the other tightly in hers. It wasn't as bad as it could have been, Harry thought, revolving slowly around the spot. Pavardi was steering. He kept his eyes fixed over the heads of the watching people, and very soon, many of them, too, had become have come onto the dance floor, so the champions were no longer the center of attention. Neville and Ginny were dancing nearby. He could see Ginny wincing frequently as Neville trod on her feet, and Dumbledore was waltzing with Madame Maxine, who was so dwarfed by her that the top of her pointed hat, the top, hold on, he was so dwarfed by her that the top of his pointed hat had barely tickled her chin. However, she moved very gracefully for a woman so large. Mad-Eye Moody was doing an extremely ungainly two-step with Professor Sinistra, who was nervously avoiding his wooden leg. Nice socks, Potter, Moody growled as he passed the magical eyes, staring through Harry's robes. Oh, yeah, Dobie, the house elf knitted them for me, Harry said, grinning. He is so creepy, Pravardi whispered as Moody clunked away. I don't think that I should be allowed. Harry heard the final quavering note that the bag... Oh, bless you. Harry heard the final quavering note from the bagpipe with relief that weird sister stopped playing. Applaud filled the hall once more, and Harry let, Pravardi, uh, let go of Pravardi at once. Let's go sit down, shall we? <clears throat> oh, but this one's a really good one, Pavardi said, and the weird sister struck up a new song, which was much faster. No, I don't like it, Harry lied as he led her away from the dance floor, past Fred and Angelina, who were dancing so exuberantly that people around them were backing away from fear of injury, or over to the table where Ron and Padma were sitting. How's it going? Harry asked Ron sitting down and opening a bottle of butterbeer. Ron didn't answer. He was glaring at Hermione and Crumb, who were dancing nearby. Padma was sitting with her arms and legs crossed, one foot jiggling in time with the music. Every now and then, she threw a disgruntled look at Ron, who was completely ignoring her. Pravardi sat down on Harry's other side, crossed her arms and legs too, and within minutes was asked to dance by a boy from Bobaton. You don't mind, do you, Harry? Pavardi said. What? said Harry, who was now watching Cho and Cedric. Oh, never mind, she snapped. And she went off with a boy from Bobaton. When the song ended, she did not return. Hermione came over and sat down in Pavardi's empty chair. 
She was a bit pink in the face from dancing. Hi, said Harry. Oh, sorry. Hi, said Harry. Ron didn't say anything. It's hot, isn't it? Said Hermione, fanning herself with her hand. Victor's just gone to get some drinks. Ron gave her a withering look. Victor, he said. Hasn't he asked you to call him Vicky yet? Hermione looked at him in surprise. What's up with you, she said. If you don't know, said Ron scathily, I'm not going to tell you. Hermione stared at him, then at Harry, who shrugged. Ron, what? He's from Drum uh, Durmstrang, spat Ron. He's competing against Harry, against Hogwarts. You're, you're... Ron was obviously casting around... Uh, for words strong enough to describe Hermione's crimes. Fraternizing with the enemy. That's what you're doing. Hermione's mouth fell open. Don't be so stupid, she said after a moment. The enemy, honestly. Who was it that wanted his autograph? Sorry, who was it? Who was the one who was all excited when they saw him arrive? Who was the one that wanted his autograph? Who's got a model of him up in his dormitory? Ron chose to ignore this. I suppose he'll ask you to come with him for a while while you're both in the library. Wait. I suppose he asked you to come with him while you were both in the library. Oh, yeah. Yes, he did, said Hermione, with pink patches on her cheeks glowing more brightly. So what? What happened? Trying to get him to join Spew, were you? No, I wasn't. If you really want to know, he... He said he was been be coming up to the library every day to try and talk with me, but he hadn't been able to pluck up the courage. Hermione said very quickly and blushed so deeply she was the same color as Parvati's robes. Yeah, well, that's his story, said Ron nastily. And what's that supposed to mean? Obvious, isn't it? Said Car uh, He's Carcroft's student, isn't he? He knows who you hang around with. He's trying to get closer to Harry, get inside information from him. You get near uh you get near enough to jinx him. Hermione looked as though Ron had slapped her. When she spoke, her voice quivered. For your information, he hasn't asked me one single thing about Harry, not one. Ron changed tack at the speed of a light. Then he's hoping you'll get him uh Help him find out what the egg means. I suppose you've been putting your heads together, uh, tr uh, together trying uh, during those cozy little library sessions. <clears throat> I never help him. I'd never help him work out the egg. She, Hermione said, looking outraged. Never. How could you say something like that? I want Harry to win the tournament. Harry knows that, don't you, Harry? You've got a funny way of showing it, sneered Ron. This whole tournament's supposed to be about getting to know foreign wizards and making friends with them, said Hermione shrilly. No, it isn't, said Ron. It's about winning. <laughs> People were starting to stare at them. Ron, uh, Harry said quietly, I haven't got a problem with Hermione coming with Crom. But Ron ignored Harry too. <clears throat> Why don't you go and find Vicky? He'll be wondering where you are, said Ron. Don't call him Vicky. Hermione jumped to her feet, storming off across the dance floor, disappearing into the crowd. Ron watched her go with a mixture of anger and satisfa satisfaction on his face. Are you going to ask me to dance at all? Padma asked him. No, said Ron, still glaring after Hermione. Fine snapped Padma, and she got up and went to join Pravardi and the Bobaton boy, who conjured up one of his friends to join them so fast that Harry could have sworn he had zoomed him there by a summoning charm. There is Hermione, said a voice. Crumb just arrived uh, at their table, clutching two butter beers. No idea, said Ron mulishly, looking up at him. Lost her, have you? Crumb was looking surely again. Well, if you see her, tell her I have drinks, uh, he said, and he slouched off. 
made friends with Victor Crumb, have you, Ron? Percy had bustled over, rubbing his hands together and looking extremely pompous. Excellent. That's the whole point, you know. International magical cooperation? To Harry's annoyance, Percy promptly took Padma's vacated seat. Top table was now empty. Professor Dumbledore was dancing with Professor Sprout, Ludo Bagman with Professor McGonagall, Madame Maxine and Hagrid were cutting a wide path around the dance floor, as well as waltzed uh, waltzed through the students of Karkaroff was now nowhere to be seen. When the next song ended, everybody applauded once more, and Harry saw Ludo Bagman kiss Professor McGonagall's hand and make his way back through the crowds, at which point Fred and George accosted them. What do you think you're doing, annoying senior ministry members? Percy hissed, watching Fred and George suspiciously. No respect. Little Bagman shook off uh, Fred and George fairly quickly, however, and spotted Harry, and spotted Harry waving and came over to the table. I was hoping my brothers weren't bothering you, Mr. Bagman, said Piercy at once. What? Oh, not at all, not at all, said Mr. Bagman. No, they're just telling me a bit more about those fake wands of theirs. Wondering if I could advise them on a, on the marketing. I promised to put them in touch with a couple of contacts of mine at Zonko's joke shop. Percy didn't look happy about that at all. <clears throat> and Harry was prepared to bet that he was uh, rushing to tell Mrs. Weasley about the moment uh, to tell Mrs. Weasley about it the moment he got home. Apparently, Fred and George's plans had grown even more ambitious lately. If they were hoping to sell to the public, Bagman opened his mouth to ask Harry something, but Percy diverted him. How do you feel, sorry guys, I got the hiccups. <clears throat> How do you feel about the tournaments going, Mr. Bagman? Our department's quite satisfied. The hitch with the Goblet of Fire, he glanced at Harry, was a little unfortunate, of course, but it seems to have gone very smoothly since, don't you think? Oh, yes, Bagman said cheerfully. It's all been enormous fun. How, how's old Barty doing? Shame he couldn't come. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Crouch will be up and about in no time, said Piercy importantly. But in the meantime, I'm more than willing to take up the slack. Of course, <clears throat> it's not all attending balls, he laughed airily. Oh, no, I've got to deal with all sorts of things that have cropped up in his absence. You hear, you heard Ally, Ally, Ally Be Bashir? Was caught smuggling a consignment of flying carpets <clears throat> into the country. And then we've been trying to persuade the Transylvanians to sign the international ban of dueling. I've got a meeting with the head of magical cooperation in the new year. Let's go for a, rock, a walk, Ron muttered to Harry. Get away from Piercy. Pretending they wanted more drinks, Harry and Ron left the table, edging around the dance floor, and slipped out into the entrance hall. The front doors stood open, and the fluttering fairy lights in the rose garden winked and twinkled as they went down the front steps. They were found themselves surrounded by bushes, winding ornamental paths, and large stone statues. Harry could hear splashing water, which sounded like a fountain. Here and there, people were sitting on the carved benches. He and Ron set, uh, set off along one of the winding paths through the rose bushes, but they had gone only a short way when they heard an unpleasant, familiar voice. Don't see what there's a fuss about, Igor. Severus, you cannot pretend this isn't happening. Karkaroff's voice sounded anxious and hissed. Uh, and hushed, as though keen not to be overheard. It's been getting clearer and clearer for months. I've been, I'm becoming seriously concerned. I can't, you can't, I can't deny it. Then flee, said Snape's voice curtly. Flee, I will make 
I wouldn't make your excuses. I, however, am remaining at Hogwarts. <clears throat> Snape and Cockroft came around the corner, and Snape had his wand out and was uh, blasting rose bushes apart. His expression was ill-natured. Squeals issued from many of the bushes, and dark shapes emerged from them. Ten points from Hufflepuff, Fawcett, Snape snarled as a girl ran past him. And ten points from Ravenclaw, too, Stebbins, as the boy went rustling, rushing after her. And what are you two doing, he added, catching sight of Harry and Ron on the path ahead. Karkaroff, Harry saw, looked slightly discomposed to see them standing there. He had his his hand went nervously to his goatee, and he began winding it around his finger again. We're walking, Ron told Snape shortly. Not against the law, is it? Keep walking, then, Snape snarled as he br brushed past them in his long black cloak billowing out behind him. Karkaroff hurried after Snape. Harry and Ron continued down the path. What's got Karkaroff all worried, Ron muttered. And since when have he and Snape been first named terms, said Harry slowly. Then he reached a large stone reindeer now, over which they could see the sparkling jets of a tall fountain. And shadowy outlines of two enormous people were visible on the stone bench, watching the water in the moonlight. And then Harry and ha heard Haggard speak. Mamem, mamum, hold on, mamen, I saw ya, I knew. Oh, the moment I saw you, I knew, uh, he was saying in an oddly husky voice. Harry and Ron froze. This didn't sound like the sort of scene they ought to walk in on. Somehow, Harry looked around, backing up the path, and saw Fleur Delacour and Rogers Davies. Roger Davies, standing half-concealed in the rosy bush nearby. He tapped Ron on the shoulder and jerked his head towards them, meaning that they could easily sneak off that way without being noticed. Fleur and Davies looked very busy to Harry, but Ron's eyes widened in horror at the sight of Fleur, shook his head vigorously, and pulled Harry deeper into the shadows behind the reindeer. What did you know, Agrid? said Madame Maxine, a distant purr in her low voice. Harry definitely didn't want to listen to this. He knew Hagrid would hate to be overheard in a situation like this. He certainly would have done. If it had been possible, he would have put his fingers to his ears and hummed loudly. But that wasn't really an option. Instead, he tried to... In uh, interest himself in a beetle crawling along the stone reindeer's back, but the beetle wasn't interested enough to block out Hagrid's next words. I just knew. I just knew you were like me. Was it your mother or your father? I, I don't know what you mean, Hagrid. It was my mother, said Hagrid quietly. She was one of the last ones in Britain. Of course, I can remember her too well. She left, see, when I was about three. She wasn't really maternal sort. Well, it's not in their genes. It's not in their nature, is it? Don't know what happened to her. Might be dead, for all I know. Maddie Maxine didn't say anything. And Harry, in, dis in spite of himself, <laughs> took his eyes off the beetle and looked over the top of the reindeer's antlers listening. He had never heard Hagrid talk about his childhood before. Me dad was broken hearted when she went a uh, tiny little bloke my dad was. By the time I was six I could lift him up and put him on top of the dresser if he was if he annoyed me. Used to make him laugh. Hagrid's deep voice broke. Maddie Maxine was listening motion motionless apparently staring at the silvery fountain dad raised me but he died of course just after i started school 
sort of had to take care of me my own way after that. Dumbledore had a, had Dumbledore was a real help, mind. Very kind to me, he was. Hagrid pulled out a large spotted silk handkerchief and blew his nose heavily. So, anyways, enough about me. What about you? Which side do you, uh, which side do you get it on? Maddie Maxine had suddenly got to her feet. It was chilly, she said. It's chilly, she said. But whatever the weather was doing, it was nowhere near as cold as her voice. I think I will go now. Uh, said Hagrid blankly. No, don't go. I've, I've never met anyone, uh, another one before. Another what, precisely, said Maddie Maxine. 